there were three church lady attenders uh, and they saw each other at the store. One said, COVID-19 has our attendance down to 90 on Sunday mornings. That's nothing, said the other. Ours is down to 40. The third, a single old maid said, it's so bad at our church that when the minister says, dearly beloved, it actually makes me blush. Well, across the street from the UN building in uh, Manhattan, there's a little park on the corner. I'm sure many of you have seen it. On a huge granite slab, uh, there is the words, they shall beat their swords into plowsheds, their spears into pruning hooks. It's very impressive, very moving. Uh, but this wonderful text has little to do with what's going on today in the United Nations or throughout the world or any other human organization for that matter. It has something to do with an act that God will perform someday. Uh, the prophecy comes from Isaiah 2 verses 1 through 5, and it's a picture of the miraculous work of God. It says that the temple in Isaiah 2, 1 through 5, that the temple of Mount Zion will be lifted up above all other mountains. Now that may not seem like such a big deal, but you need to understand that Mount Zion is really smaller than all other mountains. And it's almost like it's a molehill compared to the mountains that surround it. And yet God is making a statement here in Isaiah 2 that he's going to make uh, the really the peace of God, the people of God, flourish above everything else. Isaiah's picture is not only one of political and military dominance, it's God's word through his people and finally coming through Jesus Christ that all nations will be attracted to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When God judges between nations, they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears to pruning hooks. When God's just and loving rule comes, he will unite all who acknowledge his rule into one human community and they will learn war no more. That is what the hope is for every believer. Contrary to what uh, people typically think of about Christian hope, it's not a pie in the sky type of escapism. In other words, going to heaven and hanging out with the angels, that's what you're hoping for. It's much better than that even. At best, heaven is only a temporary resting place. It's kind of a place that we're going to be holding until God creates a new heaven and a new earth and the Christians will be given that place to dwell. And we will dwell with Jesus who will be our king forever and ever. Now, how hopeful are you that by September, there will be a time where we will be back to normal? I'm sure just a little less hopeful than you were back in the spring when we all hoped that things would be back to normal by the 4th of July, yet, here we are. I hope it works out for you. I hope you find what you're looking for. I hope COVID-19 is as bad as it gets in my lifetime, that this is the worst that I will ever experience. I also hope I don't gain too much weight in being homebound all these past several months, especially as you prepare to eat your 30th ice cream sundae this week. A lot of times we hear the phrase and we think of being hopeful about things and it's really a phrase that hope, it's loaded with hopelessness. Even though our hearts can be in the right place when we say things like that, they often form a significant part of our response to situations where it seems that there's very little hope, really to hope for. While there's something to be said 
for aspiring affirmations, vocalizing what we're hoping or working towards, we see that a lot of times hopelessness comes out. And people say these things and they mean well, but in their heart, they really don't have hope that it's going to turn out well. Authentic hope requires for us to do more than just saying words about things like that to make people feel better. If we want to genuinely hope for something, we need to understand what exactly hope means. Many of us believe we are living in an unprecedented time in history, but that's far from the truth. God will deliver us from COVID-19. Ever since man has walked on earth, there have been events that swept across the earth. You think of the flood of Noah. Uh, you also think of the different viruses that took place over the years. Do you know in 165 AD, there was the plague of Gallon that killed 5 million people. Now don't forget, 5 million at that time is far more staggering than 5 million today because the population of the earth was much less than what it is today. In 541 AD, the Justinian plague killed some 50 million people. In 1347, the Black Plague, we're all familiar with that one, that's the one that was carried out by rats, killed 75 to 200 million people. In 1520, the smallpox killed around 50 million people. And of course, in 1918, the Spanish flu killed some 50 million people as well. There have been var various outbreaks all over the world. The truth is, we have been challenged to face a truth that humanity would rather not admit. I am usually not all that prophetic, but I can say this with certainty. Someday, every one of us is going to die. The question is not if, but when. It's a result, whether it's a result of a virus, physically, I can't tell you that, but I can tell you something else. It is a virus, but it's a spiritual one. In the Bible, it's called sin. We prefer not to admit it. We would rather use words like faults, defects, bad habits, mistakes, and a hundred other words to make us feel better when we commit sin. It's best described as any word or deed in which we place ourselves on the throne and remove God. Thankfully, there is a vaccine for sin, and it's Jesus. A vaccine that Isaiah predicted over 700 years before Jesus arrived in Bethlehem. Plagues intensify the natural course of life. They intensify our own senses of mortality and frailty. The plagues search us. They discover in us either the way of the flesh, which is self-preservation, or the way of the spirit, which is self-given sacrifice. They also intensify opportunities to display love that is contrary to those feelings of abandonment and isolation. Christians, we have seen many times where they rose to the challenge in every century, winning both admirers as well as converts. So what is hope? One of my dictionaries define it this way, to wish for something with expectation of its fulfillment. Events such as what we've been experiencing lately acts as a reminder of how helpless we really are. Since we are so helpless, it should cause us to go to God and look for help from him. The psalmist in Psalm 42 says these words, Why, my soul, are you so downcast? 
Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Hope is a small word, but it's a powerful one. Why? Because in hope lies the power of the human soul to turn to God and live as if his promises are going to come true. Psalm 31, be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Some people believe hope is an emotion. We say things like, I'm feeling very hopeful today. But true hope is a discipline, a determination to believe in God's reality and power, even when the world seems to be crashing in around you. It's the kind of hope that Abraham had when God told him in Genesis 12, when Abraham was the age of 70 and still childless, that he would become the father of many nations. Paul in Romans 4.18 says this about Abraham. In hope, Abraham believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. That is the genius and the power of hoping in God. It flies in the face of calamity saying, the world can do its worst to me, but I will still hope in the Lord. Still, I will know that this is the day that the Lord has made and he will take care of me. The key to surviving any challenge or crisis is hope. Hope that Jesus loves you. Hope that he is right now working out a solution for you. Hope that the future of your life is in his hands and that your life, as bad as it may seem now or as good as it may seem now, is nowhere near as good as what it's going to be tomorrow. It's the hope that Jeremiah talks about in 2911. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. Plan to give you a future and a hope. For the next several weeks, we'll be seeking for this type of hope for those of us who are feeling helpless lately. With the power of God's hope, we can overcome all things that to wish to rob us of any joy in the Lord. Isaiah 40, 31. But they who wait for the Lord or who hope for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not grow faint. Functionally, Christian hope and worldly hope are the same. They both denote a positive expectation. Other than that, Christian hope and worldly hope are actual worlds apart. When unbelievers express hope, they don't necessarily have a basis for their hope. They may just be hoping for the best, at best, the hope of the world is rooted in a fallible thing or person. The basis of Christian hope is a hope revealed in Hebrews 11.1, 1, which says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The word assurance used here literally means that which underlies or undergirds. That means assurance in the reality that underlies the mere appearance of things. In other words, faith is what underlies the hope of a believer in Jesus Christ. Think about tall buildings. I know those of you who've been to Manhattan over and over again, you can't help but to remark at the size of those buildings, they're enormous. One of the most vital aspects 
of the construction of a large building is something that none of us can see. And that is the foundation on which the building is built. The taller the building, the deeper the foundation must be laid. Also, the stronger the underlying foundation is, the more difficult it is for the forces of nature to bring that building down. Similarly, our hope is powered by our faith because our faith is in God and he is the one that underlies our hope. The deeper our faith is, the more difficult it is for our hope to be overthrown and give way to despair. The importance of hope lies in the fact that hope sustains us during times of difficulty. Even Christians are subject to adversity. One of the worst things you can do when life comes, becomes tough is to lose hope. If, on the other hand, you hold fast to your hope, you can endure anything. You know, I got, I got to say something. I was listening to my wife as she prayed before, and I think she had a hard time praying for those people who have lost their businesses recently. And, you know, you really need to understand this. I mean, it, talk about losing hope, and I feel for them. These people went through that first um, uh, hit of pandemic, and they were hopeful that they would be able to keep their businesses going, that eventually this would all clear up and things would be back to normal. People would be shopping in their stores. People would be purchasing things. People would be exercising again, having their hair done. Restaurants would be open. Food would be sold. And I'll tell you what I've noticed, and this is what my wife was trying to say. These people have given up. It's like they got a punch in the stomach and they kind of felt better after a while. And then guess what happened? As soon as they started getting up, they got punched again and they lost the fight. They can't do it anymore. You see, that's what hopelessness does to you. These people are feeling hopeless. And I believe many of us are feeling hopeless as well. Faith and hope go hand in hand because faith is the substance of things hoped for. That means we can fortify our hope by building our faith upon God. The stronger our faith is, the harder it is for us to lose hope during trials. Show me a person who has deep faith in God, and I will show you a person who is pregnant with hope. No matter how gloomy the situation in life is, that person can have a positive expectation of the outcome. They believe that whatever happens, God is in control. And they are relying upon his good and perfect will. And that his providence, it may seem bitter at times, but it's also sweet. We know that as long as God is at our side, life is never hopeless. God knows how to make all things work together for our good. He can do far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask. And then you know what he says again, Paul says in Ephesians 3.20, or even imagine. I always get blown away with that that we can't even conjure an idea that we'll be able to go beyond what God can do for us. He is limitless, and the hope that he gives to us is limitless as well. Just don't give up. Through life, um, it may seem as things are hopeless. I know all of us down through our lives, however old you are, however young you are, you've been in situations that seemed hopeless. You didn't think it would ever work out. Yet we're here today discussing these things, which are proof that they have worked out. The reason is trials can cause you to become weary 
not only in your body, but in your mind. Second, hardships, as well as spiritual assaults, can be at work trying you to, wanting you to abandon your hope in God. Notice how I said that. The devil can't rob you of your hope, but through his assaults over and over again, he can cause you to abandon your hope in God if you allow him. That's why we need to constantly have our hope fortified. So how do we do that? Well, I've, I've said it a million times, and look, I'm not legalistic about this. I'm just telling you, this is how it happens. The way it happens is, yes, meet together on Sunday morning. That's a great thing to do, to get, to get your boost. And I would say the boost that you get, hopefully today, will be able to last you 10 minutes after we close our computers off. Maybe it'll last that long. But the fact of the matter is, we constantly need to have our hope fortified. So it comes through reading the word. It comes through praying. It comes through talking to other people who are hopeful. It, it comes through coming to Bible studies or discussing these things. Even if you want to call the pastor, please, I welcome you. If you have something you want to discuss, you are, I am giving you an invitation to do so, please. That's what I'm here for not just to come and give you a, a kind of a cheering squad on Sunday morning. There's more. We need it constantly. So that's the way your hope can be girded. It has, your faith needs to be cultivated. Your faith needs to be nurtured. Coming together just for this time during Sunday morning is never enough. It's not enough for me. And I've been studying these things for years. And I know it's not enough for you. We need to constantly be fanning our faith into flames. The stronger your faith in God is, the more immovable your hope will be. Hope is priceless in helping to sustain you when life gets tough. And here's the thing. When is life going to get tough? Life is getting tough constantly, perpetually. It never really gets easy. Okay, so we need to constantly have hope reinforced and undergirded. In Psalm 27, 13, the psalmist says, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. The challenge for us today as believers is to offer a similar deliverance from fear to all those people who are around us. I've been noticing there are so many creative ways to do this. And I'm watching how people are doing some wonderful things. Even something as trivial seeming, where people are blowing their horns when kids were graduating from high school this year, and they couldn't actually come together. People were going through their neighborhoods with pictures on their cars of these kids that were graduating and honking their horns and, and hollering and yelling, letting them know that these people, that these kids have not been forgotten. That's something that seems trivial, but you know what? I guarantee you it impacted those kids. It let them feel important. How about leaving food and toiletries at the doors of shut-ins, shopping for those people who can't go shopping or won't go shopping? How about the coworker who is able to bring kits for people with kids, uh, things to do uh, for families with children uh, to kind of keep them uh, amused, keep them happy, even if it's something like a coloring book. Okay, there's so many things that can be done and have been done. You know what? I think we could learn from these things as believers and improve upon them. The list is endless. You see, mankind has been created in the image of God, and all of us have the same hopes. All of us have the same helplessness. All of us have the same despair. All of us have the same needs. 
So whatever you're feeling, whatever you feel that there, there's a void being filled in your life, well, guess what? You can use that to know how to fill the void in somebody else's life in the hopes that people will come to know you and eventually the God that you serve, okay? We can't remind the world uh, that, that all is going to be great, but I can tell you this, we can introduce the world to its greatest first responder. If we take every one of these creative ideas and do them in the name of Jesus, an, opp an opportunity presents itself for us to show them the first responder, Jesus Christ, who came into the world and through an act of unconditional love, sacrificed himself so that the most deadly virus of all, sin, has been eradicated for all those who have placed their trust in him alone for their salvation. That's a great thing to share with people. There's a vaccine that we have to share with people. If you knew that there was a vaccine that could take COVID away, I'm sure every one of you would want to share it with the world. Hopefully not to make money, but to share it because it would be the right thing to do. In this case, you have something better because it does not heal people from a life on earth. It heals people from a life of eternal torment. You have the vaccine. Show them Jesus. I'm going to give you a few passages of scripture. Uh, if you'd like, uh, you could jot them down. I'll, I'll uh, say the reference and the verse, and then I'll go back and give you the reference again, not, not the actual verse. Okay, so Psalm th 3, 2 through 6. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, the lifter of my head. I cried out to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I laid down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Again, that's Psalm 3, 2 through 6. How about this one? 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient or temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. That's 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. How about Romans 15, 13? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that the power of the Holy Spirit will give you the ability to abound in much hope. And that's Romans 15, 13. How about this one? Romans 8, 24 through 25. For in this hope, we are saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. That's Romans 8, 24 through 25. How about this one? Mark 5, 35 through 20, 36. While Jesus was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing that, they said, Jesus 
said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. Do not fear, only believe. Mark 5, 35 through 36. How about this one? Psalm 147, 11. But the steadfast Lord, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, for those whose hope is in his steadfast love. That's Psalm 147.11. And the last one today is Job 11, 18 through 19. And you will feel secure because there is hope. You will look around and take your rest in security. You will lie down and none will make you afraid. Many will court your favor. And that's Job 11, 18 through 19. One of my college professors at Columbia Bible College, his name was Johnny Miller, and he delivered the following message. When I was a teenager, I become fascinated, appalled, and grieved by the literature of the Holocaust. One scene that haunts me is a picture from Auschwitz. Above the entryway to the concentration camp were the words, I'm not going to say it in, uh, in German, okay, but it's this, work makes you free. The same thing stood above the work camp at Dachau. Work will liberate you and give you freedom. It was a lie. It was a false hope. The Nazis made the people believe hard work would equal liberation. But the promised liberation was horrifying suffering and even death. He then added the phrase, work sets you free haunts me because it is the spirit, spiritual lie of the world. It's a satanic lie. It's a religious lie. It's a false hope, an impossible dream for many people in the world. They believe their good works will be enough to outweigh their bad works, allowing them to stand before God in eternity and say, you owe me the right to enter into your heaven. But it's the love of God that liberates. It's the blood of Jesus that liberates. He died in my place and I am free. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we all face situations that seem hopeless. Emotions like disappointment, confusion, depression want to attach themselves to us. Reach out to us. Bring us thoughts of a good future. We welcome them, especially now. Lord, show us new possibilities. Help us to more clearly see our gifts and our talents so that we can use them in helping others. Help use us in ways that we would never believe possible. Father God, help us to believe that in Jesus, we have our value. Thank you that you have reminded us that we were born for a great purpose. We choose to believe that you are bringing hope into our hearts even this day so that we will have more hope tonight when we go to bed than when we woke up with this morning. Father God, we realize that hope has a name. Hope's name is Jesus. Amen.